What's up, everybody? Marshall here. Hope everybody's doing okay today. For those of you that uh, normally join my talks, I miss the last couple weeks. Uh, you know, had some stuff going on. And just, I don't know, I just wasn't really in the mood to try to get on here and, you know, chat about that. But what's up, brother? Hope you're doing all right. Did you ever get your uh, RC car yet? Or is it still not made it to you yet? The little mini RC car. Did it make it in yet or is it still out in the wild blue yonder? Still in shipping. Uh, uh, wishing I was fishing 73. Brother, have you ever used this one? The Berkeley Gulp Earthworms. Have you ever used any of those? I know you've used the gulp minnows. Ah, oh, so you think that's what's still holding it, putting the hold on it. So in other words, it's basically sitting over there in customs, waiting until that gets the clearing, and then they're going to let it go. That's what you think. I just bought some, haven't tried them yet. What I kind of want to do, and I'm not saying I'm going to do it, what I kind of want to do is take these, put them on a rod and reel, throw them out, fish them for about 30 minutes, and see what I do in that 30 minutes. Take that off, and put a real, you know, red worm on there, throw it out there, and fish it for about a half hour. In the same general location, kind of throwing the same spot. So that's why you make it fair. Because if I go to a whole different spot and fish, it's not really making it fair. But fish in the same location, basically, like from here to here, and throw out here, and then here, then here, with one, and try it out and see what I get, say, in a 30-minute time frame. And then try throwing out with the other one in that same 30-minute time frame in the same area. And just see. And then if that doesn't work, then maybe move spots and try both of them out. You know, just kind of a comparison. You know, like a uh, the gulp earthworm versus real red worms. Of course, they have these. They have these in two different versions. They have the earthworm and they have the nightcrawler one. But I, I kind of want to do that kind of like a challenge video, you know. I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to use two rods, live worm on one. Well, see, I had that as my first thought. But then again, I was thinking on um, doing one-on-one -on -one rod that's already set up for worm. You know, like start out with, say, the gulp ones, do them 30 minutes, and then do the other one. Yeah, true. I mean, that definitely works. Let's you try both of them at the same time and lets the fish come up and pick the one they want. I guess it's because I just put something on the other one that I use for brim, crappy, and stuff like that. I just put more of like a, uh, a jig on there, a little small jig that can catch brim, crappy, bass. And I hadn't tried it yet, but I could just pop that off, put me a hook on there, and add me a cork in it and do both. Because, you know, that, like you said, it's a more fair comparison. And you got a lot of people that don't know me. So it's not like we'd be doing the same video for the same people. You know, because I don't, when I come over to your site, your channel, I don't recognize really any, any of the people that are over there, except for maybe one or two. When you come over to my channel, you only recognize a few people that are generally on my talk every Tuesday. Like you, Massive Clouds, uh, 
pickerel hunter every now and then, you know. I also thought about two hooks on the same line, one bait on each. Now, that one I didn't think of. You got me there, brother. I wasn't thinking of that one at all. Like, use a double hook system. Like, you got one right here and then one right down below. But then again, they might fool you on that one. You'll get a you get a brim on this one and get a brim on this one. They'll be tied already. Catch two fish at once. Of course, that'll make you happy. I mean, you just caught two fish at one time. I mean, who, who's going to complain about that one? Well, I would definitely try tell you to try the two hook thing for sure if you want to. But uh, I haven't decided whether I'm going to go one, use it for 30 minutes, and switch off to the other and use it for 30 minutes, or whether I'm just going to put both of them out there like you're talking about and have like that. But I do kind of want to do a comparison. That way you let we let the public know whether these are really worth the money, you know, or should you just get regular worms. The benefit of these is even if they catch, say if they catch four, and the live worms catch eight. Well, this is still worth it because these don't die. Yeah. These aren't going to die. And that's the good thing about them. So as long as they catch at least, you know, say half of what the real ones catch, still wouldn't be a bad deal. Now, if these catch one and the live ones catch eight, yeah, you're going to see these may not be worth the money unless you want something you ain't got to worry about dying. Thought about making me a worm box. I made one years ago. I mean, many years ago. Oh, my Lord. This would have been 20-something years ago. Probably about 25, 26 years ago. I actually made me a worm box. Had found an old refrigerator that came out of a camper. And took that, turned it up where the door would be up here. Set it out in my backyard against the place I was living at. Put about this much dirt in it. Wet it down real good. And then every time I'd go fishing, I'd bring home my extra worms and I would dump them in there. And then I would go around the yard if I saw any worms or rake it every so often. And whatever worms I caught, I would throw in there as well. And then once I threw a few in there, then I went and got a little bit of soil and put over the top of them and wet that a little bit with my hose. You know, which I turned it on like the spray, the light spray, a little mist, lightly misted it. And next thing you know, it wasn't but a couple of months. And I had them all the way from top to bottom. And I, you know, I had only gone fishing like a week or two. And it was just, whoosh, I've got one now. It's my compost box. Oh, yeah. If you got a compost box, that, that definitely makes it easy to get you some worms. But yeah, I, uh, like I said, I did it with a small mini fridge years ago. Basically one out of a camper. That's what I did it with then. This time I thought about, you know, just doing a little small one out of a, uh, kind of like a styrofoam cooler. You know, maybe doing one out of that. And, you know, putting the dirt, putting some worms, putting some more dirt on top, going out there and moisturing them. You know, giving it a little bit of moisture to the dirt and kind of do this, you know, like every day or two and have them like that. And that way, every time you got ready to go fishing, you didn't need to buy a container, you know. But I haven't decided because I, you know, I just haven't decided whether I want to, you know, do it or not because I don't have an actual outside hose pipe. So I'd have to come inside. I use the dirt after the water. I use the dirt after the worms are done to plant veggies. Cool. But yeah, I've never, I've never tried these. Now I've tried the, you know, the gulp minnows. I got that from you. You were talking about the gulp minnows, and I decided to try them. I've gotten a 
two or three hits off of them, but I haven't caught nothing on one of them yet. But I have tried them, and I did get a couple hits. But, yeah, that was a, that was a first for me the other day, catching that pickerel. You caught a monster flathead catfish. Now, that's not that long, skinnier one that I watched that the comment went to the wrong video, is it? This is another one I haven't seen yet. Because that other cat was more like a what, blue channel. The one that I commented on, but it didn't go to your video. Notifications told you about it, but it didn't go to your video. Whoa. 36.9 pounds. Yeah, I'd say that was a monster. Yeah, I mean, considering it was the first one I've ever caught. It will be posted Friday. Considering it's the first one I've ever caught. To catch one at least 15 inches or more. Hey, I was happy. I was like, wow. Because I had him laying up there next to the tape measure. And I got to looking where he come to. And his tail come to about 17. And his head was only at about 2 inches. So I knew he was at least, you know, 15, 16 inches long. Yeah, it was a blue catfish on the other video. I thought it was like a blue or a channel, you know, a blue channel. I, I knew it was blue or something, you know. I knew it wasn't, and it was more of a long but slender, like he hadn't eaten in a while. But, yeah, man, that thing, what it was is I, I was over there near that pier, and I threw over that way, and I was reeling it in, and my kayak turned and got me right in the face. The sun did. So what I did is I brought it in. And I just set it down for a minute. And I turned just a little bit by the pier. Just so I could throw it back. Now, where you saw me hook him at, where you saw me reeling at, that back up in there was the dead end. That was the dead end of the cove. So, in other words, I went all the way up into the dead end area. I went back a little bit further after I caught him and then turned around, come up, stopped the video, and got him off the hook, let him go. And then I come back up further, started back fishing just a little bit. Yeah, like he did. And what happened was because I had the life vest on and had it zipped all the way up, the GoPro mount was on that slick material. It slid up like this. So all y'all could see was basically the rod doing all the dancing. And once in a while, you'd see him flip up into the camera. You'd see something flip up and disappear. I wished it would have stayed down. That way, y'all could have got the view of what I was seeing. I mean, because every time I did this, he was up out of the water. Y'all have got a little bit more view of him coming up out of the water than actually just a quick flash. But, yeah, man, what it was, I threw out, and I started reeling, and I felt a little bump. And I paused for just a second and started reeling again. And when I felt another bump, I reeled like two times, and then I just did this because I had a feeling something was there. So I reeled like twice, and then I just gave it a quick pop back like that. And when I did, well, that's when he pulled back down, and you could hear him running with my drag a little bit. Yeah, I hate it when it happens. Yeah, I mean, if you're wearing the life vest and you got it all the way zipped up, the camera's going to do this, especially because mine's a slick, a slick material, slick life vest. Now, if it was a cloth, like a regular fisherman's life vest, the cloth kind, I believe it would have stayed put. But you got to think about it. It's here. And then you're doing this. And this. With it right here. On that slick material. And then you're. You're paddling. And, and, and it's right here under your underarm. So all you're doing all this. And it's moving the life vest here. And it just. Zirp, 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 zirp. And every time I pull it back down. It won't. What I thought about trying, I'm, I'll try this before I actually go on the water to see if this will work. I'm thinking, unzip the life vest, take it off. All right, put the harness on, get it set where it's going to be. Put the life vest on, click it down at the bottom, and zip it up part, part of the ways, up to about the bottom of the camera area. That way it doesn't interfere with the camera and see if 
like this. It may, but it may mess with part of the field of view. I think what I'm going to get me is I don't like the one that slides on my head. I think I'm going to get me that action, that action hat, which is a hat with it made into it already. It's got the little part for the camera right here. The camera will sit right here, and then you can just tilt it forward a little bit to get the views. But it'll mount right here, and that hat, if it comes off your head, the hat floats. It's called an action hat. And I want to get one of those. Well, that way, if I'm out there, no matter if I've got the life jacket on, zipped all the way up, and I'm doing all this, and I'm throwing out like this, no camera's moving at all because you got it right here. And then if you fall in, the hat falls off your head. It's just sitting there floating. All you got to do when you get you, when you look around and see where it's at, reach over there and grab it or swim over to it, grab it, put it back on your head, and then worry about your kayak reason I don't want it on my head right now is duh if I fall in the water hat falls off bloop 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 yeah uh it was one of the other guys that joins in on our chats on Tuesdays could have been massive clouds or it could have been that Sam's hobbies one of them two told me about the magic you know about that hat about the action hat. I'm thinking it was, I, I want to say Massive Clouds told me about the action hat. And he heard they were, that they float. So what, well, I watched the video with a guy wearing a, a GoPro right here on his head. And he flipped the kayak on purpose. And you would see him swim over to his hat and just pick it up. He goes, man, I love this hat. And he put it back on his head. And he'd get right back in the kayak and he, he was just testing the limits to see what it took to flip a kayak, certain brands of kayaks. And I'm like, I want something like that because that way if I fall in the water, your hat's floating. It's not done sunk to the bottom. You know? So, yeah, I'll, I'm going to uh, type it in when I get off of here. Uh, they probably sell them on eBay, you know, like everything else. And if not, they got them on Amazon probably. But, if you can get something that floats that you can put on your head, then it see it's not then it doesn't have anything to do with the life vest. Plus, having a camera right here on my chest, you hear because when that life jacket moves, when you're throwing out, when you're paddling, you hear all the noise from that in the camera. You know, whereas if your camera is up here. It's tilted forward so it sees what you're seeing. And all you got to do is put it up here real quick. Turn it on. Go outside and film a few minutes where you got it angled at. Or go outside and sit on your kayak. Just sit down in your kayak and pretend like you're fishing. Just sit out there for a few minutes with it at one position. Turn it on. Look at the footage. Move the camera just a little bit. Press record or tell it to record. Shoot a couple more minutes. Look at it and go, okay, there's that's where I want it. And then you sit there and go, okay, that's where I want it to be. You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't be that hard to get it set up. I like it on my chest because I like the fact that it gives. You, you're seeing my hands. You're seeing me reel. You're seeing me throw out. When I bring it up in the boat, you're seeing it in the boat. I like that because if it's up here and I'm looking towards the water towards the front of the kayak, you're not necessarily going to see it down here between my legs. You're not going to see the fish or see what I'm doing, you know, what lure I'm fixing to get. And I do like the chest mount, but I don't like it sliding up and down. The, sliding up and down the life vest, I don't like. Now, the two ways to fix that is get a different life vest that isn't as slick so it doesn't slide up and down or try putting on the chest mount first then putting the life vest on and zipping it up near the bottom of the thing. So that way it doesn't interfere with it. And then just press record. Take a little bit of footage of you sitting on the kayak and see what it gives you. See if the if the sides of the life vest are in the frame, in the video frame. If it's not, then you know you can work with that. 
but I got to look into that. Like I said, because I, I didn't like all the noise that it gave, you know, from being right there on the chest. But I'm not going to put it up on my head, get out there in the kayak and not have anything to keep it there. And you're sitting there and you're fishing and you fall overboard and your hat falls off and it's hooked to it and it don't float. Bye bye camera. That's just like that head mount. If you're in that kayak and it falls off your head. Bloop, 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 and it may be gone before you can grab it. You know. And it depends on where you're at. Yeah, you got a question. What you got? What you got? Well, whatever your question is, wishing I was fishing 73, I'll do my best to try to answer it if I can. But what I was, what do you think is the best cam view? Super linear or which? Uh, let me see if I can see where I've got mine. I don't even know what I've got mine set on, to be honest. I did like the view it gave me, though. I mean, when I pulled that thing down and set it right, I could see you could see my feet and all that area up there in the front of the kayak. You could see the name of the kayak. Yeah, I know more about some cameras, but I don't know a lot about this one. Hold on a second, though. I've just got this one on wide. That's what I've got this one on. I've got it on 1080, 60 frames a second, wide field of view. That's what this one's on. I know you can't see that, but trust me. Yeah, see, that's not going to come in clear enough. But that's what I've got this one on. It's on 1080. 60 frames per second and a wild field of view. Wide field of view. Uh, and you see my footage. And you see what kind of you know footage it gives you out this way. That's what the wide gives you. You know, more footage out this way. And you know, when you're fishing, you want to kind of give them a better view. But I may go in there and fool around with it, but that's what I'm running right now. 1080p, 60 frames per second, and wild fi wide field of view. I usually use super, but you can't see details. Try backing it down to just a uh, wide and shoot one time with it like that and see what you think of it. And if you don't like that, then go over to the linear. You can always play around with them. Unless right up close. But yeah, I like, uh, I do like the wide so far, but what's up, Bull Gear RC videos? Now, this man knows a lot about cameras. Bull Gear RC videos, wishing I was fishing 73, is asking which camera view do you think is best? Super linear or which other one on like a GoPro Hero 5 Black? And I told him I run mine at 1080p, 60 frames a second, and I just run it on wide view right now. But I may play around with some of the other options later. And he's saying that when he uses super, you can't see the details in the image, in the footage that he takes, unless it's right up close.
All right, Bull Gear RC says he does 1080p, 30 frames per second, and he uses linear or linear. I just said linear, you know, but it could be linear. But I think everybody has their own preference. Uh, I should drop down and do 1080p 30 because anybody will tell you the lower your frame rate and the lower your, you know, everything else, all your settings, generally the more battery life you get. And I think out of this, GoPro Hero 5 Black, I think out of it on 1080p at 60, you only get like 80, I mean, you only get like 55, 60 minutes. What does the frame per second do? It makes it one thing when you're editing your video. You don't see any kind of stutters like that in the video. Plus, if you put it on 1080p 60, it gives you a chance if you want to do any kind of slow-mo. Like, say, if you hook a fish and you're reeling him in and he's doing this across the top of the water. If you want to slow that down a little bit to make it where it really shows him really slowly dancing, that's where that 1080p 60 as opposed to 1080 30 comes in handy. Or if you jump it up even higher, you can really slow it down where he's just. And you, and you see in each little speckle of water as it splashes up behind him. That's a good reason for running your like 1080p 60s and higher up to do slow motions. But a lot of people that's become the norm like on run videos, is 1080p 60 frames. On my run videos, I do 1080 50 with my Yeek action camera. I do 1080 60 with I do 1080 60 with that one. My Nikon Cool Picks. I run that one. 1080p at 60. That's what I do my trail and crawl videos with. As long as I'm somewhere where I think the camera's going to be safe. You know, I put it on a tripod like this that I can bend and situate pretty much the way I want it. And then I shoot it with this camera. But now if I'm somewhere like right near a water or right near a cliff where I think it's going to fall, I would have one of my action cameras with me. And I would shoot the video with that because I don't want this falling off a cliff or falling in a lake. Then I would use one of my action cameras. But otherwise, I use this for all my all my trail videos. Every trail video I do or crawling video generally gets this. Unless I'm doing something where I think I could fall or the camera could fall, then I take an action camera. Like the crawling video I did with the red cat when I modded the tires on it, I did that with an action camera because I didn't want a chance breaking that up on them rocks. I got an Osmos pocket a couple weeks back. Haven't took it out of the box yet. Congrats. I heard those are good. Real good. But wishing I was fishing. 73 back to your thing try different things man like he does 1080p 30 frames a second the linear he does it that way i do 1080p 60 wide you're doing 1080p i figure 30 frames per second probably the linear mode just you know go outside or walk down to the lake take your rod and just Fish a couple minutes, put it in one setting on your chest, switch it over to another setting, and check it out and see what, what you like better. Or give it to your friend and ask him. Say, hey, when you were editing this video for me, which way did it look better? And get his opinion, too. And get, get a bunch of people's opinion. I mean, because I'm definitely not an expert, expert on the GoPro Hero 5 Black. Like I said, I had just gotten this one. Uh, I'm just going to try some different things. But so far, I like the wide, especially on the kayak.
Yeah. I mean, no one camera setting is for everybody. I know some people who still film in 720p because it really gives them a lot of battery life. They'll be like, well, man, I can shoot double the time with 720 as I can in 1080, 60. You know, so a lot of people won't, won't shoot no higher than 720p. I only film fishing videos. I do a lot of close-ups. Yeah, that's why I use this one. I like this one for my close-up shots better. You know, because of the zoom it has. You know. This one's got a real big zoom on it. I mean, it can zoom... 35x that's why i really like it so i can make that truck look like it's right here or i can make it look like it's way back there you know if i if i need to that's why i like taking that camera unless i'm like i said i'm somewhere dangerous then i'll take something like this or something like my firefly 6s i'll take one of those you know because I'd much rather break my Firefly 6S or the GoPro Hero 5, which, by the way, has a warranty on it. So I'd much rather break this than my bigger camera down here. But since you're only doing fishing videos and you're not really doing a whole bunch of close-up, close-up where you're zooming in, I would just play around with your settings a little bit and see what you like, man. Or ask the guy you said that you got doing your editing of your videos ask his opinion as well maybe shoot a video in a different setting next time like say if you've been shooting it at 1080p 30 frames a second linear or super go out and switch it up to one of the other views you know and try shooting it that way or just do a few minutes one way and a few minutes of the other you know like do your normal but then, in, say, for five minutes of the video or for three minutes of the video, shoot it in a different way. That way you can let him look at the footage and he can go, I kind of like the view in the other one. Or he can say, I kind of like the way we're doing already, the way you're doing it. You know, and then you don't change anything. Yeah, it, and it also depends on how much fish eye. I mean, people have come to expect some fish eye. Especially if you've got a camera that shoots a wide field of view. You know, there's generally a little bit of fish eye. But I just did a fishing video using this camera. And I was out on my kayak fishing. Fish eye is when it takes the edge of the film, the edge of the scenery, and it gives it a warp distortion. In other words, you'll see a tree that's supposed to be like this. You're looking at it, and the tree is completely straight. In the video, the tree will look like this. It warps, distorts the image a little bit on the edges. The wider the field of view most of the time is generally the more fish eye you'll get at the edge of each side of your video. And it also depends on how you got your camera set up, how bad your fish eye is. But I just shot that one of me out on the water fishing from the kayak. And if there is fish eye there, nobody's really paying it attention because I'm out there in a, in a wide section of this cove fishing and people are paying attention to this, throwing out, and paying attention to see what you're trying to catch. And they're looking at the water and the trees and everything. They're not really looking at the edge. It depends on what your situation is as to how much that fish eye is going to bother you. Now, if you're sh sh shooting videos of a building, yeah, it's going to show up more because the building's supposed to be like this. And when you shoot the video, the building looks more like this or like this. The fish eyes done caused a lot of that. And on your RC videos, if you're shooting and you're not 
got the zoom right or you've got it too much of a field of view, you will see this at the edge of the whole video, some kind of distortion. And you're like, oh, man, I hate fish eye. But sometimes you don't even hardly notice it. Some cameras do a better job of hiding it. Some cameras, it's just, woof, you can't help but see it. That's my gist on a little bit about the fish eye. I mean, I'm not the be most tech savvy camera person in the world, but I do know a lot. A, a lot of cameras. It's the field of view. Like if you got a camera that shoots 120 degree field of view or more, it's generally going to have more of a fish eye effect to it than a camera that only shoots at 90 degree. Field of view. Fish eye will make one tire look bigger than the other one in a run video. Yeah, but I don't have as much trouble with that running this camera, you know, running that Nikon. I don't have a whole lot of trouble with running it when I'm running this. That's why I use this mainly on trail runs. I've never had anybody tell me, man, there was a bunch of fisheye effect in your last trail video. I guess that's why I use this one. And since I'm not near an edge of a cliff or not right at the water where this can fall in, I'm not worried about it just back up in the woods trailing, maybe climbing over a few things. And I just... I either deal with it or I don't zoom in at all or I bring it into some of the lower settings so that way you don't get much fish eye when I have to use an action camera. You know. Now, I have that Feutech, the Summon Plus, which is a little 4K action camera already on its own gimbal. And I've used that to do run videos. And generally, it's very little to none. It's almost unnoticeable what little bit I get on it. Now, I get more on the Firefly 6S. I get more fish eye on it, more on a GoPro like this if you were doing a run video than I do on other stuff. But like I said, my main camera for out in the woods is that Nikon. My other main camera is the Feutech Summon Plus that's on the gimbal, three axis gimbal on it. And I hook it to the controller and then I just, you know, get near the vehicle and shoot footage of it. And I've never really had much of a fisheye effect on. But yeah, it can. It can make it look, and you'd be like, wow, look at that fisheye. But you know, it depends on what you're shooting. And it's not like he's going to be this close to a truck. He's generally not going to probably be that close to the, any other stuff he's shooting. But I don't think he's got a whole lot to worry about with the fish eye when he's out there fishing. Especially if you're just showing it from your chest and you're showing a, a whole big area of the lake. You're not going to get a whole lot of fish eye. Or he hasn't gotten much that I've seen. And if it puts it up in the in the trees, in a bunch of trees, you don't see it as much. Because I just shot a video, like I said, of me being down there at the lake fishing on the kayak. And I didn't notice any fish eye in my video. And I was using this one set on wide. Now, I may have missed it. I may have to go back and look at my video now. Just to see if I see any fish eye effect in the edge of the on the edges of the video. But to be honest, when I was watching my own video, when I was editing it and everything, I was mainly focused where the kayak was at, where the front of the kayak was at, and where the rod tip was headed. So you could see where I was casting out and seeing if, where I was throwing it, where I was trying to catch fish at. But that's just what I noticed when I was watching it while I was editing it. I wasn't really paying attention at the very edge of the film. You know, 
But I can go back and look at the video and see if there's any in it. Because that was my last video was me kayak fishing down here at the lake. And before that, I took my ECX Mirage, the Doomsday one, and went out for my second adventure with it in the woods over here. But I took the Nikon when I shot the video of it. And I got some nice close-ups on it because, well, I was told I got some nice close-ups. Those were some nice camera angles, man. Some nice close-ups. So nobody said, you know, we saw a bunch of fish eyes. So I, I'm, I'm good with the Nikon as long as I'm not in a dangerous area. And then I'll just have to take my chances if I get a little bit of fish eye. But, yeah, I like that trailer you said you're working on. I saw your welder trailer. It was pretty cool looking. Like I said, I hope both of y'all are staying safe. Trying my best here. It remains to be seen how it's going to work out, but you know, I'm still trying. Like I said, I fished down here. I actually took the kayak off the back porch, helped, you know, took part of it down, got it down the edge of the steps, and then I went and got the back of it, picked it up, and walked it down, and got down off the steps with that in. And then I picked up on the front and just rolled it around the front with the wheels. Rolled it around front, loaded up my fishing gear, put my life vest on my kayak, just laid it on there. Laid my camera on my chest in my chest mount and everything in the boat. Got down to the water after I wheeled it down there. Took the wheels out from under it. Put the life vest on, zipped it up, clipped the clip down here, put the chest mount on and everything, and got in the water with it. I'm in mission with I'm in Michigan with uh, all the Coronies people. Yeah, some places are worse than others. I mean, they're talking about opening South Carolina up completely back for business, like maybe the first week of May or something like that. And I'm sitting here going, yeah, that wouldn't be smart in our area, not in my neck of the woods in South Carolina. My county alone, it has 171 cases, which is up by 20% from last week. It has eight dead, which is up by 60% from last week. The county below me has 215 cases, which is up by 8% from last week. Six dead, which is up none. Same as last week. So, the county above me is 185 cases, which is up by 46% from last week. Twelve dead which is only up by like, I think it said, it was up by like 42%. So, that's just right here. So, you're talking about 26 in a three-county radius. You're talking about 26 dead people already from it. Between my county, the one above me, and the one below me. There's 26 dead during this virus. I mean... And we're talking over, we're talking around 500 cases at least between the three counties. 500 cases and 26 dead. That's rough. Now, I mean, and we we went up by 60% on our dead. No lie now. I got this. I made a mask. This ain't it. This is just me showing you the cloth. My mask got delayed. We had ordered some masks. They were saying they were going to be here at one time. Then they went back and changed them, said another time. Now they're saying, you know, halfway through May, my gloves that were coming, they're saying end of May, possible June. So I took an old shirt, old T-shirt, cut it, cut it right here, and then I took part of the shirt, made straps, 
cut in right here and right down here on each side, push the sections through there, tied knots in them, come around the cloth and tied another knot on all four sections. And then I just go to the store. Basically with something like that down to my chin area. And we happened to have some bright blue gloves. They were my girlfriend's when she got out of the hospital. They came home with her and there were a pack of gloves. She had those. So she gave those to me. So I could wear the shirt thing mask I made. And wear the blue gloves to Walmart. So at least I had some protection. Well, had this little young thing. Uh, uh, punk, whatever you want to call him. Well, know it all. I should have said, well, at least I'm not dumb enough to come out, you know, come in the wrong entrance. He's coming in the exit side when I'm going out the exit side. And the Walmart people are fussing at him. They're like, it's clearly marked off. It clearly says entrance only over here on the entrance side to keep people six feet apart from each other. And him and his little dumb little cronies, two other buddies, they come in the exit side. Well, they turn around to walk off and he makes the comment, boy, he looks goofy. That was his comment. Boy, he looks goofy. And I just, I just lost it. I looked at him. I go, well, at least I'm not going to die from the virus. I'm sorry if I was mean, if that was rude, but I just literally looked at him and said, well, I may look stupid, but at least I'm not going to die from the virus. You know, I kept my mask on like I had it, kept my gloves on, went to my car, loaded up the stuff I had in the car, got in the car, and drove off. When I got home, I done the mask, dropped it over so it could be washed, pulled the gloves into each other, dropped them in the trash, went over and washed my hands with antibacterial soap. And I'm sitting there going, you know, just thinking about this kid and his friends. I'm like, first of all, you walked right up to me on the wrong side. Where if I had it, I could have given it to you. Or if you had it, you could have tried to give it to me. Because you walked right up like this close before the Walmart people got you stopped and turned around. Because you wasn't paying attention. Because you were with your boys or your friends or what your dogs or whoever you want to call them. Acting stupid, being silly coming up through there. And you just walk right in the wrong side. And there's clearly a sign. And they even got buggies sitting out there with arrows pointing you to tell you to come around that way. To keep people six feet apart. They're only letting you come in here and come out the other side. And then he wanted to make a comment because I made a homemade mask. So, I just... I don't like wearing it because I have chronic bronchitis. And it really... Makes it hard for me to breathe with that on. I can only wear it 30, 30, 45 minutes maximum. And I'll be panting like a dog because I can't hardly breathe. So I don't like wearing it. But when the numbers in our town, our county and the counties around us are flying up like this kind of rate, I would be an idiot to go to Walmart without any kind of protection on. And it just, I mean, I guess it was just a teenager being a teenager saying dumb stuff. But it just, uh, what, I, something happened in the store. I forgot what it was. And it, I was already agitated with that. And then when he come by me and just happened to say, boy, he looks goofy. It just set me off at that moment. So as soon as I stepped past him, I just turned to look. That's when I turned to look back at him. And I may look goofy, but at least I'm not going to die from this virus. You know. I haven't been to Walmart in five weeks. I don't see how you can do it, man. I don't have the storage area to get enough stuff to keep in the house for no five weeks. And Walmart ain't had enough in stock when I did go that you could buy five weeks worth of stuff. You know. 
So I just couldn't do it. So I've got to go to Walmart at least generally once a week. I don't have that option. Now, if I had the option to stay at home, I go to a small local grocery store. Oh. Yeah, but see, the problem with that, unless you go to one at a certain time frame and catch it at the right moment, most of them in this county I live in, they're packed too. I went by one the other day, like Piggly Wiggly, as I was riding by. You couldn't hardly see any empty spots. And I'm like, holy cow. You don't want to go in there? It's like Madhouse Rush Hour, you know. And I look over here at another one, kind of like a Save More or something like that. One of those type grocery stores, a little small, you know, no name. One. And there was probably 50 cars in the parking lot. And I'm sitting there going, good God, there's nowhere that you can go that ain't crowded. The most uncrowded place you can go is possibly a Dollar General. And that's a smaller store. I've been to all the hot spots except Louisiana, not so much as a sniffle. Ah. Well, me, I'd be worried more about a cough than a sniffle. Like if somebody sounds like a smoker, the way they're hacking their head off, just, and it just starts out of no reason. I'd be more worried about them than I would Somebody got sniffles because they say some of the first symptoms are fever, which you can't tell that when you're in the store with them. You can't really tell if a person's got a fever, you know, and you don't want to get within distance to find out if they got a fever, but they say starts with a fever and then you just get an unexplained cough where you can't quit coughing. You just cough a bunch. They say that's most of the, mostly what it starts with, but, I haven't heard anybody coughing really in the Walmart. Like they might like, <clears throat> you know, to clear their throat, but you don't hear them coughing and then just keep coughing. You know, and I haven't really heard anybody sneezing, but somebody's giving it to somebody else. Somebody's getting it because we wouldn't have jumped up, you know, 20% in our cases in one week. If somebody's not giving it to somebody, I take 5,000 milligrams of D3 and 50 milligrams of zinc every day to help the immune system. Yeah, it doesn't hurt if you're taking stuff that helps your immune system. But using this doesn't hurt either. And there's a lot of people in the county I live in don't seem to know how to use their head. Yeah. Other than maybe to put a hat on or to comb the hair a certain way. I mean, you're walking in Walmart, you're seeing other people wearing masks and gloves, and you still want to walk right up to them and talk to them. Not the smartest thing to do in the world. Not when they're telling you to stay six feet away. I said, I mentioned it to somebody the other day. I said something. I said, how do you like that six feet away? Oh, I ain't worried about that. I could care less about trying to stay six feet away. I'm like, hey, that's your right. But I said, I'm going to follow the six feet. And somebody walked near me to talk to me when I was taking my kayak to the lake. They got to the front of the kayak. I was at the back of the kayak messing with the wheels. I was like, well, that's okay. They're 10 feet away because my kayak's 10 foot long. If they'd have come any closer, I was like, hey, man, I'm not trying to be rude, but Let's try to keep it at least six feet. I would have said that if they would have got any closer. I was out on the water. I was talking to an old boy that was out there fishing from his john boat. And I used to work with this guy. And when we started going past each other to talk, I said, hey, man, I'm going to keep it six feet if you don't mind. I said, I'm just trying to be safe. I said, I hope you are too. Yeah, could be. I mean, you never know the exact total numbers. And I mean, even the site that I got all this information from said some of the data could be incorrect. 
because a lot of people haven't reported their up-to-date stats as of when I got the stats today. Said it could be more, or some people could be, you know, getting it said wrong. Because if you go in there complaining that you've got the coronavirus and then you die, yeah, it could be something else that, you know, really caused your death. But it could be coronavirus. You were already sick and the coronavirus just pushed you over the edge. You know, me, I just look at it this way. Better safe than sorry. I mean, if I could stay six feet away from somebody to try to stay safe and that's all I've got to do, then I'm going to try to do it. But now if I'm working and I've got to physically get up to you like this to hand you something, all I can do is either try to wear a mask and wear gloves and try to use hand sanitizers. That's about all I can do. But if I can fish in the lake with you, pass by you about six feet away from you and talk to you, hey, we're not hurting anybody because we're both out on the water. We're not near a crowd. <laughs> and we never got closer than six feet to each other. And we sit there and carried on a probably a 30-minute conversation out there on the lake. I didn't film that because I didn't think they should be filmed. I caught a view of them when I turned around in my kayak, saw them up here fishing further back up from where I was at. And so later on, I turned the camera off, and I went up there and got like six or seven feet away from them, started chatting with them, you know, because I knew them. Talked to them a little bit, stayed about, oh, it's probably about eight or ten feet away probably about the length of the kayak away from them. Then I turned my kayak around, went back into the cove, and left them up there where they were at. You know, I'm just trying to be as safe as I can. You know, just like the gloves. I wear them. I don't like them. You think I like wearing bright blue gloves on my hand? <laughs> What's up, massive clouds? The gloves I'm wearing out when I go out look like this. They're bright blue like that. I mean, they stand out like a sore thumb. So you, you got me walking into Walmart with bright blue gloves on and a mask I made out of a green shirt to hold me over until my disposable mask get here. Uh, I've been okay, brother. I've had some things that I'd take care of, but I'm cool. Now, I got a question why I got got you in here. Who all uses the GoPro Hero 5? And does it mix up your files? And here's what I'm talking about. Okay, I just shot clip one. Boom, I'm shooting clip one. Okay, I'm just, ooh, I'm shooting clip two. Okay, now I'm going to shoot clip three. Okay, now I'm shooting clip four. But when you go to put it on your computer and you're looking at it, it's done numbered them wrong. What is actually clip one should be over here in clip four spot. What is clip three should have been clip number one. It's done misnumbered them, the file system. My kayak video where I went to the lake fishing, it had three of my files in the wrong num with the wrong number. Oh, never used a GoPro? I was hoping somebody could give me some help on that with some information. I don't have a clue why it's, why it's numbering them wrong. Because what I do is I, I was out there and I'd shoot a clip. Then I would stop it like if I was going to change plugs or stuff. And I would shoot another clip. And I get to looking. When I get home, and I got the video, I got the video clips up there. I'm watching back the video clips to see how they look, to see what I'm before I get ready to start editing. And I click on clip one, and I'm going, "Where'd this come from? This ain't the beginning." I watch clip two, and I'm like, "That ain't the beginning either." I get to clip three, and I go, and it says, "Hey, this is Marshall." I'm like, "That's clip one." It's listed as clip three, but it was actually clip one. The clip that was all the way up here is number one. 
was actually clip three. Clip two was right. But then I had like clip four, six, eight, and ten. And two of those were mixed up. And I, I'm not really sure why it did that. And I'm going to say this. GoPro Hero 5. GoPro. That's the only camera I've had that's ever done that to me. Because I used that Firefly 6S for over three years. And it never put the clips in the wrong order. Never. If I shot a clip and shot another clip, shot another clip, and shot another clip. When I come home, one was one, two was two, three was three, and four was four. Congrats on the Sun Dolphin SS12 kayak, my friend. I saw that. I was just finishing my statement about this. I don't really understand it, man. Why it mixed my clips up. I really don't. When my cheap Firefly 6S doesn't mix them up. If you, if I can go out and do an RC video and do 43 clips doing an RC video with this near a water or something or on a hill cliff somewhere, afraid it's going to fall, come home, all 40 something of them is going to be in row. You missed it. You missed it, brother. I done dropped it. It's already on YouTube. I'm down there at the lake in the kayak fishing. You missed that one. I have a Hero 7 black and white. I'm not a fan. Now, well, I'm not a fan of the way it's doing my video files on this. But, well, I will go ahead and tell you this. It was a costly day fishing, Massive Clouds. One lure gets destroyed by the fish. When, when you watch it, you'll understand. One lure gets destroyed by the fish. One lure, I throw out, and the sun hit me in the eyes. That's the only thing I can think of, because I let go too soon. And right up in the tree area. And I thought it caught a tree branch, so I figured I'd just get over there kind of close to it, tighten up my drag a little bit, and yank it down, pull the branch down like it normally does. No, I didn't catch the branch. I caught vines. They wasn't giving it up. They were like, F you, you ain't having it. You ain't getting this back. So my brand new Bill Lewis bloodshed is up in some vines. My $50 Yee action camera never glitched on me. My GoPros do. Well, I haven't had to, I haven't had a problem with the GoPro glitching on me. And I haven't had a problem with the footage being looking good. My only problem with the GoPro so far is it misaligning, putting the files in the wrong order. You know, because say you go out and shoot eight, eight clips or 10 clips or 20 clips when you're doing a run video of different sections of where you're at. You would want them to be in order when you put them on your computer so you can watch the first one first, the second one, and have them in order as you're editing so they're already in order. So you can look at what you want to do with them. No, this thing here put listed one as the first clip and it was the third clip and vice versa. I get to number three and I start watching it. And here I am going, hey, Mar hey, it's Marshall out on the lake fixing to do some. And I'm like, that's listed as number three. That's number one. Number one was three. Two was right. That one was right. And then, like I said, I had four, five, six, seven, eight. 10 and two more of those were mixed up so that was my biggest issue with it but yeah man threw that lure right in the vines i thought it was in the tree because the vine was wrapped around the tree and i didn't see the vine i thought it was just on a branch so i, I paddle over there i look up and i see the edge of it so i just tighten up my drag and i start jerking then i spot the vine that's hung on i'm like oh crap and i jerked again and all i come back with was mine so there was Bill Lewis, brand new lure, first throw, bye-bye. Fish tears up a lure. That's two lures. <clears throat> this was a new mistake, if ever. I'm tying on the other Bill, Bill Lewis, the littler one, the shad looking. I'm tying it on. I don't know what happened. The line just slipped out of my hand. 
hadn't got the knot tied good. It just came right off the line, hit the water. As soon as it hit the water, boom. There wasn't even time to grab for it. Because as soon as it hit the water, it went down. So I'm like, three lures in one day. Yeah, it, it was just a normal day of fishing. That's the way I said it. I put that in my description, in the video description. I go, just a normal day of fishing, laughing out loud. You know. But. Now, since that video, I have brought my kayak back home and changed some things up. Because I realized some things, the way I had some things set up, ain't exactly perfect for me fishing on that kayak. They wasn't set up the way I needed it. I thought it was cool. I thought it would work good that way. But I'm a short guy. Only around 5'4", roughly. And realistically, that's probably if I'm wearing boots. Hiking boots. If I'm just wearing a tennis shoe, I'm probably like 5'3 and a half, realistically. And I've got short arms. I'm going to be honest. i got short arms as well. So reaching behind me, grabbing stuff is really hard. And I've been burning up the Cinco's though. But I get out there in the kayak. You'll see it when you see me fishing. And I had to reach behind me to get my tackle box. It was almost impossible to pull out of that crate. That's also because my tackle box is full. If I took about half the tackle out of it, it probably would have been easier to get out of there. But anyway, small tackle box, almost impossible to get out of that crate and bring around to me. And the mistake I made was I just set the tackle box back there, not thinking. I get out on the water, and I'm trying to do stuff, and other stuff I needed was under, ta under the tackle box. So that was impossible to get to until after I'd brought the tackle box up in between my legs, up front. So then when I get through fishing, I'm going to get up out of the kayak and my foot slips on the edge of the bank, goes down into the water and made me fall back into the kayak. Well, I cracked that little tray that I had put up there in between my legs, that little tray to set stuff and everything in. So I just brought the kayak home. I put the wheels under it, brought it home, cut that, took that tray out of there, threw the tray away. So that way, yeah. You know, that way I don't have to worry about it when I'm sliding. If I, if I fall in the kayak, nothing's going to break there. Plus, it gave me more access to that little compartment there <clears throat> and right in front of it. And what I did was where I got that the leash that holds the paddle, I've got it clipped onto a little clip spot. I put a, another rod leash there and clipped on. And I'm going to take the tackle box and set it right up there above that little clip. And I'm going to put the rod leash around it and clip my tackle box right there. So that way, when I'm out there fishing, right up above, right there at my feet and in between my legs, right up in that area, my tackle box will be up there. And I can just lean forward a little bit, grab a hold of the handle, leave the rod leash on it, bring it to me from the strap, you know. Well, actually, I have it hooked onto the strap part. Bring it to me, get what I need out, close it back up, set it easy back up there. That way, if the kayak tips over, it's still hooked on by a rod leash. It may hang down from the boat, but it's not going anywhere. And I took my fish net and moved it up into that little spot up at the front where the straps are. And I hooked it. I'm hooking it to like a rod leash as well. That way, if the kayak flips over and the net falls overboard, it'll just dangle. But now I can reach up there at my feet right past the tackle box and just grab the fish net. I just took the crate out altogether. Because when I put rods in the in the rod holders in the crate, I was having trouble reaching behind me and grabbing them from the position directly behind me. Because that's where I had them. Now, if I had them on the sides of the crate, I might could have reached to the side and grabbed them. But on the very back behind my seat, it just, and you had to do all this to get to them. And it was just, it was really hard to get to them. And now that I got them two rod holders right here beside the seat, I can just reach and grab the rods like this. So they didn't need to crate for the rod holder anymore. 
And since I'm going to put the tackle box in front of me so I can access it easier, I just I cut all the zip ties that were holding the crate crate on, took it up off of there and set it to the side. And it makes strapping the wheels on the kayak cart, it makes strapping that on so much easier not having that crate in the way. Because when I brought it home, I took the wheels out from under it, got rid of the crate and everything, got rid of that other little tray, hooked all the other stuff the way I'm going to want it. And then I went and put the wheels back under it, strapped it around, and it's a lot more. I felt unstable as hell in the narrow Sun Dolphin 12 SS kayak. So you've already been out in it once. Now, when's your, when's your most unstable feeling? Is it when you're throwing out? Is it when you're reeling in? Or is it getting in and out of it? Just curious. All the time laughing out loud. <laughs> and you went with a 12-footer. They're supposed to be more stable than a 10-foot. To be honest. Uh, now, just feels like it's working me all the time to stay balanced. It's narrow. In other words, it's 12 foot long, but it's really, in other words, it ain't like wide. Yeah. In other words, yours will go faster. Yours, yours, you can get it going faster on the water, but it's not as stable. Whereas mine's a little slower paddling it, but mine's a little bit wider. Well, you did, I did tell you about the, when you go to get in it, position it sideways at the water where you're going to get in. Have it like, here's the bank. Here you are. Turn it sideways. So that way you can come over to it. You can just sit down and bring a leg in at a time right there at the bank. In other words, you got it in the very shallow, turn long ways like this. You walk down to the edge of the water, get right up beside it, and then turn around and just ease your butt down on the side of it. Put one leg in, then bring the other leg in. And then you just take your paddle, if you're not far enough out, to start easing out. Take your paddle and slowly push yourself out. I kind of want to get a Vibe Sea Ghost. It has a chair in it. Yeah, but I'm going to give you my opinion. Uh, you might want to see if you like this one at all. Like, go out, to catch a few fish, see how it is, bringing them in, and seeing if you're going to like a kayak. Because some people will tell you in a heartbeat they can't they can't deal with a kayak because there's just not enough space. All right, man. Good luck on the spray painting job. Good to hear from you. Be safe. I understand wanting a bigger one and having the fancy chair and everything, but if you don't like kayaking at all, if you get out there and you don't like it and you start reeling the fish in and you don't like the way it is trying to get a fish into the boat, into the kayak and trying to get it off the hook and everything, then a you know, you might not like any kayak unless it's a real humongous one. But you got to think about it. You got to get that kayak to the water. And you got to load it and unload it and do all that. All right, later, man. You got to get it loaded and you got to get it unloaded. I had my kiddo in the front of the kayak, so maybe we were just fighting each other's balance-wise. Yeah, at least try it, try it once by yourself. Because they may say that they're rated for 200, 250, 275, but a lot of times they ain't quite what they say. And you can expect at least this. When you get in the kayak and you first do this,
to adjust yourself. It's going to do like this a little bit. So yours says it's rated for 395 pounds. I'm going to say 325, 350 maximum, my opinion. I'm going to say 45, but that's fake. Just them drumming it up, saying it's that, you know, to make people want to buy it. Oh, I can put 17 rod and reels on it. I can carry all my tackle. You know, they're going to exaggerate some. I don't think anybody tells the exact, you know, scope of things a lot of times. But like mine, I think mine says 275. Well, I'm around two. So I know I can't carry everything I own tackle wise. You know, so I generally go out with two to three rods. And then that smaller tackle box is about like this. And I've got a net. You know, and I've got a seat under my butt, you know, that little foam seat. That can't weigh hardly anything. We were about 3.30 with everything. Yeah, try it. And I'm not saying this because your kid was with you, but try it by yourself first before you say, this ain't the kayak for me. Take, try taking two to three rod and reels at the most. And go out there with a little bit of tackle. And, or, or go out there with the same tackle. Go out there with everything you had that you were fishing with and your tackle, but without the kiddo. And just give it a try and see if it feels as off balance. Yeah, they sit low in the water. That's the thing about the sun dolphins. The sun dolphins sit a lot lower in the water than like my kayak. My kayak's higher up out of the water. Even though it's a cheap name brand, mine's Lifetime. Mine was a two hundred dollar kayak. Yeah, it was one ninety nine, I think it was, or one ninety eight. But mine sits a little bit higher up out of the water. Sun dolphins have always known been known to sit lower down in the water, but it makes them faster when you're paddling. They seem to move faster than say like my Lifetime, but they're not quite as stable. Some say. But what I would do is I would take it back out, say two or three rod and reels. Your buddy has a lifetime tamarack. Well, that kayak that your buddy has is the identical body of what my kayak is. Body-wise, molding, it's the exact same kayak except for I have one hole up here in between my legs, that one hole, that cubby hole where you put stuff up there, and then a, like a cup holder. His has another cubby hole hatch behind the seat that he can put stuff in. And then he has the one rod holder over here to the right that comes with the boat. And then he has the butt part to the seat that mine didn't have, mine didn't come with. You sit directly down on the kayak on mine. On his, you have the butt part of the seat, rod holder over here to your right, and you have one more hatch behind the seat. Whereas I just have the hatch up here between my legs. So all you got was one more hatch, a rod holder over here on the right, you know, and the butt part for the seat, which ain't that much. And I was like, for a hundred bucks more just to get that. And the only color they had it in was that olive green. And, you know, to me with the watercolor, you can't really see it on the water good. It wasn't, it wasn't standing out. And I'm like, wait a minute, I can get that $100 cheaper. I can add a rod holder. And I can add, I can put something for a seat. I might go with a 10-foot boat style with two seats. Man, I would actually at least take it back out by yourself. Maybe just go out with two rods. You know, I would at least try it with two rods, just you and some of your tackle. Take two rod and reels out, some of your tackle, and just you. And at least go out and try it that way first before you go, oh, no, 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 no. I don't like the stability on this thing. And see, at least that way then you'll know. Because if you go out there and you just take a portion of the tackle you took, and you just take you, and you just take two rod and reels, and you get out there, and it's 
really making you feel like you're about to go in the lake, then yeah, it may not be for you. You know. But if you get out there and it's more stable with just you, the two rod and reels, yeah, lifetime, it is. They're, they're pretty stable as long as you don't raise that seat up like I did in mine. That was my mistake when I put that other seat in there and it raised it up. like It was like four inches higher than what, you put, what it was originally. And I was, and I, it was like this more every time I reached back to grab a rod out of the rod holders before I put the other ones. I reached back there to that crate to grab a rod, and it was doing this. And I was like, and then when I went fishing this last time, I had one rod because I took three rods with me, and I had one of them in that rod holder until I got down there, and then I brought it forward, <laughs> and it was just too hard reaching behind me in that crate, and I'm just like, this crate's not working. And then when I had to grab the tackle box and bring it forward, so now the crate's gone. But I've got it. I've got it about where I want it now. You know. And yeah, like you said, it is pretty stable. And now I don't have any a bunch of excess weight. My only weight is me, rod and reels, tackle box, and the anchor. That's basically my weight now. Yeah, all I could think about is all my stuff sinking when I did flip. That's why I have rod leashes. That's why I have rod leashes to put around my two rod, my rod and reels here, and this rod holder up here on my left. If I stick a rod down in it, I can flip this thing around, and it locks the rod in place. So I've got it locked. So if the boat flips over, none of my rods should go anywhere as long as they're in them positions. Now, if I'm fishing and I get flipped, the one I'm holding, it's... You know, for sure. But the way I'm going to have the tackle box is the big strap that you put over your shoulder. I'm going to have a rod leash on that at least. So that way, if it flips over and the boat's laying like this upside down, the tackle box will be hanging from it. But it'll still be there. Electronic reels that sense the spool getting sloppy, it corrects it. Yeah, you don't really want that going in the lake. Because electronics and water don't work so well together. You know? Yeah, them electronics and water don't work so well. But no, I, I haven't never seen... The one you're talking about. But. Yeah. Uh, going to pick up the Shimano Curado DC. But at least. At least take it out for a second run. I mean. You know. Take. Take two of your cheaper rod and reels that you still fish with. Not your most expensive that you own. But two of your cheaper rod and reels that you fish with, take them with you. Take you some tackle that you know you're going to need and use. And just go out there by yourself one time. Turn the boat sideways like this near the edge of the water. So that way you can just ease up to it. You can turn around, ease your hip down into the seat. When you sit down in the seat, bring a leg over, then bring the other leg over. Then just take your paddle and push away from the bank. And then go out there and see how it feels with just you. Now, if you don't feel every, whoa, whoa, every two seconds, then it would just be something that's maybe not suitable for you and your son together. Or it would be something that you got to work on the positioning or work on the amount of stuff you take with you. Yeah, we can't fish a lake since this COVID unless you're in a boat. So I was forced to buy a kayak, laughing out loud. Yeah, because, I mean, think about it. Everybody can stay six feet away if they're in a boat. How many fishermen do you know pull their boats right up against each other when they're actually fishing? Those are when they're having the boat parties and they want to get drunk. They pull up the pontoons side by side and tie them together, and they sit out there and they drink and listen to music. But if you're out there fishing, you don't want another boat within six feet or less than you because you're you're trying to catch fish 
you know. But <clears throat> give it at least one more try for your benefit and for mine. Give it a try without your kiddo and maybe slack off on the tackle just a little bit. Maybe only take two rod and reels and maybe only take about half the tackle you took and just give it a try and see if it's way more stable. If it is, then you get an idea of where you're at. If it's not, if it's still the same shaky, shaky, oh man, I'm scared of this thing, then you might want to go ahead, take it back home, spray it down, clean it up as good as you can, and try to do what you can with it towards moving it if you don't think you're going to like it. But at least try it one time without the kiddo first. That way you make sure it wasn't you and him causing the problem. You know, that way you make sure it was just the boat. That way you can say, okay, this boat just ain't working. Might take it around and mess it out. Yeah, I mean, you could just take it out, just the boat. Don't take no gear. And go out and paddle around and see if it feels pretty stable to you. If it feels stable with no gear, then you know, okay, with me and my son and all that gear I took, that was too much. Yeah, now you can do that. A lot of people do that. They'll take the kayak and they'll hold the paddle like this. And they'll lean one way or the other. And they'll, they'll go a little bit further each time they lean to see where the tipping point is. And then that lets them know, okay, I can't go quite that far. This is as far as I can go. When I go here, it goes over. You know, and that lets them kind of know. Like, say, if you're trying to bring in a fish and you're reaching down to net him or get him up and you're grabbing for him, you'll know, okay, if I go here, I'm good. But if I go here, the boat's going over. So, yeah, I mean, if you ain't worried about getting wet, <laughs> that's one way to find out what the tipping points are. But make sure you don't have anybody with you so that way you know, hey, this is the tipping points of me and the boat. But my advice, if you've got a, rock, if you've got a paddle holder, like a latch that holds the paddle in place, I would attach the paddle to that before you try flipping that boat because some paddles sink. Just saying, some paddles don't float too good. If you flip that kayak over, your paddle could start, you know, sinking or it could drift really far away from you. You know, and then you got to try to go out there and now your boat's over here 50, 60 away. Does your kayak make a lot of noise on top of your vehicle? To be honest, I didn't listen to it. Mine sounds like a damn tornado is coming. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't listen to it when I had it on my station wagon. I knew I had it strapped like four ways. I had four straps on it. I had it strapped coming from the front down to my front bumper. I had it strapped from the back going to the back bumper. And then I had straps on each side of it on the sides of it here. So I had it strapped four different ways. So I knew it wasn't coming off. So I just turned my music on and ignored it. I didn't even want to hear it. So I don't know what it sounded like on the way home. This was on my uh, Subaru Outback, which has a roof rack. So I didn't even pay it no attention. He hasn't took it out yet. Because he saw my video that I'm talking about where I'm out there on the kayak. And he's like, oh, my kayak's only eight foot. Compared to your 10 foot. Like that. And he goes, if I ever get it out in the water. He saw my fishing and we discussed it. And he's saying he may have to mod some of his kayak situation. Because he says he's a short guy. He's got his rod holders on the very back of his crate behind his seat. And I mean, you think about it. The crate's here. The rod holders are way back here. You got to try to. But, uh, yeah, he says he's either going to take those rod holders, take them off the very back of the crate, and put, put one on each side of the crate like this. That way he can reach right here, just reach his arms back and grab them. Or he's going to put them at the front of the crate, which would be behind the seat. I don't know about the about directly behind the seat because it's, you know, it makes it harder to come around, I think, and reach for them. To me, I like the idea up near the front but on the sides of the crate. That way you can just bring your arm back like this, reach to the crate, lift one up out of there. <clears throat> but he said he may have to do something like that, spin his crate around. 
or move the rod holders to the side. Because he saw my video and we were discussing my video. And he's like, well, man, that might not work out with my crate where I've got how I've got mine set up. And I told him, well, it didn't work for me and I'm short. He goes, well, I'm short too, bud. And he's like, so I may have to swap my crate situation. And I'm like, well, I didn't need the crate back there because I drilled those holes and put those flush mount rod holders on each side of my seat. I didn't really need them anymore. Plus, I got the rod holder up here to the left. I'm like, I can take three rods with me and be good. So I didn't really need the crate. And I can break my tackle box up. And because I'm short, my feet don't go all the way to the, towards the front of the boat. So I can just take my tackle box and set it right up there, right in front of my feet. When I first go out there, while I'm paddling and everything, and when I get out fishing and I get ready to start changing up baits, I can grab it by the strap, bring it up to me, set it between my legs, change what I want, and then just ease it back up there and go back to fishing. But, and I also put my, like I said, I moved my, my fishnet up towards the front of the boat. I've got it stuck all the way up at the front of the boat, right up there where it says lifetime and everything, all the way up there. But I've got it hooked on to like a rod leash. That way if the boat flips over and the net falls out, it hangs from the boat. I don't want to lose anything if I can help it. But if you're fishing with it and you flip, unless the rod's got a hollow end on it, rod and reel could go blue, 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 blue. But I had one one time, it went in the lake and the rod end, the butt of the rod down here was hollow. So that part of the rod stuck up out of the water like this. You can just see it in the water just bouncing. So it never sunk completely. And I was able to get a neighbor to take me out there in a the John boat, able to get my rod and reel back. But if it falls out of a kayak and it don't have that hollow end on the rod, and you can't grab it quick enough because you're just now coming back up to the top, yeah, you could lose a rod and reel. Yeah, I... I thought about losing forty dollars and I thought losing forty dollars in lures is bad. I would really be upset losing a pole. Yeah, man. I mean, you figure, and I'm just saying, you figure if you got a sixty dollar rod and reel combo, I'm just saying sixty, you'd be pissed if you lost it. But if you got a two hundred dollar rod and reel combo, you'd be past pissed if you lost it. But it kind of comes along with the territory. If you go fishing. You expect on a fishing trip to generally end up losing one of your lures at some at one time or another. You just expect it could happen because it a lot of times it becomes the norm. Up, oh, I threw a little too hard and I caught this spot. I yanked to bring it back, and broke it. Or I threw underwater, got hung up on a rock underwater, snapped off. So you expect every now and then losing, you know, lures, but you don't expect when you go out to actually lose a rod and reel. Yeah. So, yeah, that pisses people off more. What's up, Steve? We were just talking about the, he bought him a kayak. And right now he's kind of afraid of his kayak because he says his is not as stable as a lifetime kayak. He got him a, a 12-foot Sun Dolphin, the SS. And he's a little bit about worried about it not being stable. Well, Let's say maybe a lot worried about it not being stable. That's what he's thinking. But he took it out, had it loaded down with fishing gear and fishing rods, and he had his kid with him. And he's saying that could have been some of it. There you go, Massive Clouds. You could just do what Steve did. Buy you a stabilizer kit. Put it back behind the seat. Run that bar across. Mark where you want it, drill your holes, put the bar, attach the pieces, run the arms down. When you get out to the water, you fill up your inflatables, hook them on, and get out the water. And when you do this, it ain't going nowhere. Huh? Switch channels to give you two thumbs up, laughing out loud. Thanks. But yeah, you can put the stabilizers on it instead of buying a whole nother boat, my friend. And I, I believe the stabilizers would get you stable enough where you don't need a big boat. 
But I mean, if you really want a big boat, I mean, you know, that's your business. But I like the fact that I can get in that and go fishing by myself and have some fun <clears throat> and bring it back home by myself. Excuse me. I mean, I took that kayak on wheels and walked from my yard down past my yard, past that empty lot, past that next door neighbor's yard, went into the woods and rolled it right down to the water, untied the wheels, took the wheels out from under it, slid it into the water, and climbed in it and went fishing. He's telling you Massive Clouds to check out his playlist, his kayak playlist. You can see I put them on in one video. Here It shows you how, what he did with his stabilizers. He bought the kit on eBay. It was a stabilizer kit set on eBay. He bought them, mounted it on the kayak, and then you just inflate the two inflatables, one on each side, and it keeps it from doing all this. It would make you a lot more stable. And I think, what what was it, about right at $100, Steve? In between eighty and a hundred dollars for the for the setup that you got. Cause I think you'd rather spend eighty to one hundred more dollars and make your kayak stable than to try to turn around and get rid of your kayak and try to buy something else. You know. Oh yeah, outrigger. Yeah. Yes, yeah, like a hundred dollars. I went fishing today before it got dark. It sucked. Only got one bluegill. It is still cold and it rains all the time here. Yeah, we've been having like three, four, five days of rain straight. And then it'll clear up for a day or two. And it's back and forth like that. And I'm trying to hit it in between. Like that day I went, man. I couldn't have asked for better water. I mean, the water was perfectly calm. I mean, just. Just calm as it could be. I doubt if it maybe had any ripples the, pretty much the whole time I was out there. I don't remember seeing the water moving really at all. If it was, I wasn't paying no attention. And after all the rain is not good, everything gets messed up. But yeah, I mean, Massive Cloud, you could do an outrigger on it. You're talking somewhere between 80 to 100 bucks, depending on who you order it from. You put you, you mount that main bar on there, it'll be screwed to the kayak. And the other part you can put on and take off, the other parts you can take off for hauling it. And then when you get down to the water, you add the pieces on and you just blow up the section on each side, the floaties, and they st they stabilize it. So you ain't really got to worry about flipping. Clear today. Now they show rain like for all week now. Well, I'm going to ask you, Steve, why I got you here. Have you ever fished and massive clouds while you're here? Have you ever fished with this? It's the gulp, Berkeley gulp earthworms. Have either one, have either one of y'all ever tried these? And if you have, did you have any luck? Because I'm about to be trying these soon. I don't know whether it'll be my next trip or the next one. Never used any gut. Yeah, it's nice. All white aluminum and two separate poles that hook one, so not a big item to hook up. No, not them, but I hear they work good. I've never tried these. There they are. This is the Berkeley Gulp Earthworms. Now they do have, at Walmart as well, they do have the Berkeley Gulp Nightcrawlers. Now the good thing about these, if they work, the good thing about them is you don't need to refrigerate them. You ain't got to really worry about them dying out in the heat. If you're out fishing in the sun, you know, on a hot day, 
they're not going to sit there and fry in your boat. You know, these aren't. You can just close the lid on them, set them back in your tackle box, whatever. But if, as long as you catch, like say if you caught, if you went out one day with live worms and you caught eight fish and you went out one day with these and you caught at least four, then you can say, yeah, they're good. Try one out now, see if they taste like real worms. Nah, I'll pass. I'll pass on that. And uh, Massive Clouds, he was, you say you're going to give it another try. Good. Give it another try like it sits. But just don't take the kiddo and see how it works. But my idea is maybe not the next video, but one of the next two videos I do of me and the kayak fishing might be these versus red worms. In other words, test these out versus the red worms and see how they do. If these only get one fish and the red worms get eight fish, then you know these ain't all that. But if these get like three or four and the red worms get like seven or eight, then you can say, hey, they're worth buying. You at least catch something with them. But I, I've already got everything rigged up for another outing. I would have to change up a few things if I want to use them. What are you trying to catch with those gulps? Uh, Brim. These are the uh, earthworms, little like red worms. See, they're littler. They're more like a red worm, which is what the brim eat more. But uh, night crawlers. If I if I was using night crawlers. I'd be fishing more for cats and for bass and stuff like that, the bigger worm. But they do sell the bigger, the nightcrawler version of this in the Berkeley Gulps. But I want to try these for some brim. But I also want to try some live red worms for the brim down there in that cove where I was at. And I just want to see what I can do, especially around all that stuff in the water, all the trees and stuff. <clears throat> I really want to see what I can do down there amongst all those trees. But you got to let me know, Massive, once you try it out again, like I said, just a couple rod and reels, just you and some tackle, try it out again by yourself, let me know how it did then. Did it get any better, or is it just as unstable with just you and a little bit of fishing stuff? Then you can go, okay, do I, am I going to go for stabilizers and stabilize it up for me, or do I just want to give up and go to something else? But, you know, it's all up to you. It is your money. It is your boat. But I would at least, like you said, try it again. See where it goes from there. A guy I watched used gulp minnows, and they look like they work awesome. Oh, uh, wishing I was fishing 73. He uses the gulp minnows, and he's had good success with them. He's where I got the idea about the gulp minnows. I was watching him one day fishing with them. And he was tagging up some fish with the Berkeley gulp minnows. I was like, wow, I got to try some of those. And so I got me some small jig heads, started putting some on there. I've got a couple of bites, but I haven't caught anything yet. So, but I have gotten some bites on them. Just haven't caught anything yet. But these, this is, it's a brand new container. Hasn't been used yet. I just want to see, I just want to see if I can catch something and see how it compares. I might try some gulp minnows laughing out loud. Oh, yeah. They don't smell the best. I got the stabilizers because I figure what the heck, better safe than having a chance to flip the kayak over. Yeah, because there's always that chance. You figure 
you figure you latch on to a, I'm just going to throw it out there. You latch on to a 15 pound bass. You go to set the hook and he yanks back and you're already in an odd position. Yeah, you could go over. That's a given fact. It's a kayak. I mean, you know, they can tip. I mean, but that's like a canoe. You can tip a canoe over, you know. Steve, you got a video of the kayak on the bug. And all your gear gets messed up when you could have spent the hundred bucks to get the stabilizer kit instead. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's not worth it. If you got the money, definitely buy a hundred dollar stabilizer kit. Blow those things up with your mouth. Put the bars on there. Hook those on. Right as you're getting ready to you get in it, you know, blow them up. Hook them on. Get in it. Go. Get through fishing. Come up to the bank. Get ready to pull the kayak in. Go ahead and un uh, unattach them or whatever. Deflate them. Put them away. Bring the kayak in. Put it on your vehicle and go. Or with me, put the wheels on it and go. You know, from right here. Yeah, I got to do some. I may do some stabilizer later. I just haven't done it yet. Yeah, that, I may, it, may, it may cost me. <laughs> it may flip me into the water and then I'll be like, oh man, I got to get me a set of stabilizers. Oh yeah, if I stick with the kayak, with kayaking, that's my first upgrade. Shit, I felt like I was working like a mad dog trying to stay balanced. Yeah, I hope I can use it with this virus going on. I know the big reservoir is closed now. I seen just seen today. Maybe I can get in the little pond, hopefully. Well, here's the weird thing. They're, they're not stopping down like other massive clouds. Said they didn't have no problem with him being out there in a boat. As long as you're out there in the boat, that's why he bought it. He said people that are going down to the lakes and everything fishing that are standing on the bank, those are the people they're telling you can't be there because they don't want to stand six feet apart or further. <clears throat> so you shouldn't have a problem if you go like to a little pond or something and just put in. Shouldn't have any trouble. I mean, and like me, I went to this lake, and but I went back in the cove. And I, I was pretty sure it wasn't too many people going to see me. And I only saw a guy and a girl, a guy and his girlfriend and in a John boat the whole two and a half hours while I was out there. I saw one person in a John boat. It was two people in the John boat. I knew both of them from where we used to work. Well, I knew the guy from where he used to work. And that was his girlfriend used to come visit him while he was at work. She'd come stop in and say hey to him. And we spoke a little bit, but I kept further than six feet distance while I was out there fishing. I was like, hey, man, I ain't trying to be you know, mean or nothing, but just trying to stay safe. Yeah, you know, I figure we'll keep about six foot or more distance from our two boats. We can still chat at each other a little bit. Gorilla Bear Tech, what's up, my friend? Hope all is well on your end. Some states, you have to keep all your fish. Can't release them back in the water in case you do have COVID and don't know. Finally caught your live stream. Yo! What's up, man? Peace. Yeah. Yeah, they may go to that. Because now that that, uh, what was it, a tiger got sick in one of the uh, upstate zoos. I think it was like New York, somewhere up that way a tiger got sick with COVID and they're saying if the animals can get it, they actually taped off all the entrances and put big signs up closed. Do not enter all over at the big reservoir. I've seen today. Wow. Well, I guess you better not go in there then that wouldn't be a good idea, but I would, I would at least try the ponds. I just get a rear. I just got a rear set of Traxxas Anaconda on road wheels. Woo! Cool. 
Oh, the wrestler. Yeah, man. Uh, Steve, if it was me, I would. Uh, I would. I would try one of the ponds. I'd go ahead and load it up on a on a day you know it's going to be clear. Watch your weather for a couple of days. You know you're about to have a clear couple of days in a row. Load the boat up. Take it out there. Launch it. Make sure you got your vehicle in a good spot where you ain't gonna get in trouble for that. Launch your boat. Go out there and fish. And if they say something, say, hey, I'm practicing safe distance. I'm out doing some kayaking, getting some exercise, and doing a little fishing while I'm at it. Both of them which are good exercise. And I'm nowhere near anybody else. I'm making sure I stay six feet away. The ponds suck. There's no spots to get in easily, especially when all the weeds and lily pads and stuff grow in all the banks. So, so you're saying your ponds may be bank fishing, that you may not be able to get the kayak down to it. I had the anacondas in the front and had to start rear. And they popped the rear right. Wow. But yeah, man, uh, what about that spot you were at in the video? You can't get a kayak back in there? So it tore the rubber right off of it, huh? It ballooned, you heard boom, and it just, the rubber was just ripped, huh? Yeah, in the one pond, I will have to carry the kayak, I would say, 150 feet. Well, I guess it's a good thing yours is only like 35 pounds. If you did carry it, at least it's only 35 pounds. Stick to one eight scale belted tires. Now, Steve, have you have you thought about uh trying to put you a set of wheels on it, seeing if you can roll it back there? You know, like doing some kind of kayak cart where you can carry the cart inside the back seat of your, you know, lay it in the back floorboard of your car, or put it in the trunk. And when you get out there and you take the kayak off the top of the vehicle and you set it down, grab the wheels out, strap them on it, roll it down to the spot where you're going to fish if you don't want to carry it or if it's too far to carry, roll it down there, pull the wheels off, do your fishing, come back and put it back. The other pond, I have to walk down a steep, narrow hill of dirt and that's on an angle. Yeah, I don't think wheels would do you too good on an angle. You're trying to go straight downhill. It would probably try to push you down the hill. Trying to roll it down on some wheels. Now, I forgot where I seen it. Steve, this is at you. I don't forgot where I seen it, but on YouTube, I was watching a fishing video with kayaks. And this guy, it's just it's a kill, it's a kill protector, is what it's called. And it's like a black tape. And they put it at the very back of the boat and the very front of the boat on kayak. To help protect them. And, and some people will put it right there in dead middle, middle. That way they can drag their kayaks. That way they don't have to tote them. They put this tape stuff. It's a kill protector. And they put it along the middle seam of the kayak underneath. So they can drag it. Without worrying about it tearing up the bottom of the boat too much. You might can look into some of that. I know just going to bust my butt trying. So you got 73, 75. <clears throat> I always blew through tires due to ballooning and got tired of Gorilla Tape in the inside to reduce it. I seen that as like an epoxy tape that cures in like an hour. Yeah. A lot of people put it at the very front of the kayak coming down all the way where the boat hit, hits the water. So that way when they first come up and hit the bank, it protects right there at the front of the kayak. And also when they're backing backing it up, if they back up into something, 
the very back. But you could take that and just line the very center underneath, flip the boat over, and go all the way from the very front of it, any part that's going to hit the ground, and come all the way very to the very back of the boat, all the way back, and put that and let it cure. And that would give you a layer of protection under that boat. So if you're, if you're slowly bringing it across the ground, you got that protection under there. In other words, I'd let it cure like a whole day to make sure. And that way you could just drag it down to the water and that would protect it. And when that started to wear off, you could replace it. Balloon RC tires. Tie a few strands of RC fishing line around the tires down in the tread and it will stop them from ballooning up. My old rustler was, I sold was 71, according to the Sky GPS. Tracks is 17 millimeter ones on the speed, speed phone app, it showed 72.2. These speeds are cheap with a 3S. I tried that, Steve. Made my tires balloon in three sections. <laughs> uh I had a guy tell me that those Anaconda will hold up to about 77, 78. Well, Gorilla Bear Tech. What, uh, what'd you ever decide on a body? Or did you decide yet? Remember me and you were discussing a body? That you were going to get for speed runs? What did you ever decide on? And did you get it yet? And what did you decide on your paint scheme? What's up, Blacksmith? Foam tires don't... Foam tires don't balloon. Maybe try those. Yeah, some guys swear by foams. Thanks, bro. Hope you're healthy as well. Blacksmith, I haven't been able to pull off 60 plus on 2S with any car laughing out loud. I've been between 42 and 52, almost 53. I stopped doing run speed runs, had my transmitter die a few times, running at 70 to 80. Yeah, it's not good you run at 75 mile an hour down the road and your transmitter gives out and loses signal and the RC goes crashing. I've tried foams on a mini E-Revo and it took away about 14 to 15 miles per hour. Wow. The contact RC foams. Well, I've seen people hitting 50 and 60 like nobody's business on 2S. Uh, 10 man. 10 man RC. He's a guy that they that they started trying to do 50 or more just on 2S. And he was hitting 50 and 60 on 2S. Relentlessly. I never tried foams. Almost got a set of Jayco foams a few years ago. Yeah, because when they balloon, it makes your car faster due to a larger tire diameter. Thirty-four seventy-two gearing, huh? But forty-four to fifty on two S with a tenth scale. Well, I'm telling you, Gorilla Biotech, for a fact that uh, this guy was running one tenth scale electronics. And he was doing 50, from 50 to 60 on 2S and everything. So it can be done on 2S. It, like I said, it depends on your tires, the body, the gearing. But you can get 60 mile an hour on 2S with a one-tenth scale. It can be done because I've seen guys who did it. I used to watch when my channel was about, Oh, about two, two and a half, three years old. I had a ton of speed run guys 
who watch my videos and I watch theirs. And Tin Man, he is. He's one of the people that will tell you straight up, hey, this is what I was able to do. And he did a lot of 50 mile an hour runs on 2S. He got it up to 60 a few times with 10, 2S. There's a lot of guys who have hit 60, and that was about their limit with 2S. Yep, I remember those days. Yep. Man, I, I'd look in my chat after I'd post the video, and half of my people that chatted on my videos would be speedrun guys. Some of them have faded away and don't even do videos now. You know, some of them have. Some of them just left my channel. Hey, that's their right. Everybody can do what they want to do. But uh, Tin Man and some of those guys, my Gen 8 hits like 9 maybe. <laughs> yep, yeah, them crawlers ain't necessarily known for the speed. You know? But, I mean, everybody changes things. Everybody does things differently. I believe you can get there with the right set of tires. You get you one of those bodies we talked about and the right setup. I sold that rustler because of bills. And now I rebought another rustler ready to run brand new about six or seven months ago. Well, did you ever get you a body for it though? Did you ever buy you a body that we were discussing? We were talking about changing bodies on it and putting you more of a speed run body on there. Did you ever pick one out and get one yet? That's like, I mean, I understand a lot. Of, a lot of people have left my channel. And I understood that. And then I got where I wanted to do both of my hobbies. Well, two of my main hobbies. I was like, I love the RC, but I love the fish. So I decided to make my channel about fishing and RC because I love both hobbies. I also love riding my four-wheeler. But right now it needs a new battery. So there ain't no videos of it because I got to get a new battery for it. The battery dies in less than a week. So I got to get a new battery for it. There may be videos on my channel later time again of me putting my GoPro on my chest, riding my four-wheeler down the road, you know, down dirt roads and stuff. But mainly it's fishing and RC stuff. I'm mainly into rock crawling. Yeah, well, you know, you generally don't break them as much in rock crawling as you do in speed runs. You know, unless you it falls off a high cliff and rolls all the way down a hill 50 feet or more, you generally ain't breaking your rock crawler easily. I have an Armor Raider XL brushless. It goes 60 plus. I tried it one time on 3S in one of my videos. I never tried that ever again. It was crazy. No, Marsh. I still got to get a Le Mans body of something else or something else. But that's going to be for my Slash 4x4. Hey, I believe you can get that Slash 4x4. I believe you can get it to 60. I believe you put one of those bodies we talked about, maybe change up the gearing a little bit. I believe you'll get 60. 26, 34 mod one gearing is a good starting port for Traxxas. Stock body on my Rustler flapped and made the Rustler airborne once I hit mid 70s. Fishing, it certainly gets fishing, it certainly gets cuckoo at 55, 60 and over. Things get sketchy, heat builds up, and yes, you have the tendency to snap your R RC up in pieces when you lose range. Yeah. I've lost range during speed runs, and it's upsetting. The stock sucks for speed runs. The TQI, on the other hand, usually for the most part, works like a damn charm. But yeah, I mean, 
it's all about what you want to put on, what you want to put in your system, and what you want to put into it. What's up, Pebby Putt Guy? Yeah, I mean, some people brag about how good the fly skies are. Get you a, a fly sky radio and receiver. But if you get the right combination, I believe you're going to hit that 60 on 2S. If you got the right setup, if you get the right setup. We're talking tires, the right body, and everything. I can believe you can get that 60 on a 2S. Go watch some of the guys that have done it, like I was talking about, and see what see what they say. See what tires they're running. Look at some of their bodies they're running. Like I said, my channel used to be flooded with those guys. I mean, over half of my people that were subscribed did speed runs. They said they watched my channel because they needed to decompress and watch something that went slow every once in a while. And I mainly did trail trucks and crawlers with a boat run here and there, quad flying here and there, you know, and a few bashing videos here and there. Congrats on the new boat and my Mod 1 gearing combo in it. That 80 mile an hour on 6S, personal best, was achieved with 25 tooth pinion Robinson Racing and a black steel 36 hot racing. I want an X Max. <coughs> That's a mighty amount of money. Cool brushless boats are faster than the land RC cars. They're crazy fast. Plus, I couldn't hit those speeds without spare tunnel cap pack, which is a ProTech receiver voltage stabilizer. Just don't want to fork out twelve, thirteen hundred dollars for one. <laughs> Yeah, on my big E Revo. I'm sure 60 plus I can get on 4S. But yeah, like I said, Gorilla Bear Tech, take your slash, the 4x4, your one tenth scale, take it and just try to get it set up. Maybe watch a couple of those guys' videos. See what tires they're running on, like, the Traxxas one. And see if you can shoot the Traxxas four-wheel drive slash to 60. My Rustler's sitting at 1,300 in upgrades and electronics. But, you know, I've seen people sink, and this is this ain't meant towards any one person. I've seen people sink $1,500, $2,000 in a speed run car and still not hit the speeds they thought they were going to hit. They went and dumped, you know, $1,500 into a speed run car and then still didn't get 80 mile an hour. My rustler catches air around 55 to 60. Yeah, I mean, the body on, the, on any of those, if you stay with the stock body that comes on your tracks, this is, Generally, they do start to lift when you get up to a certain speed. But, I mean, that's like I had a guy the other day. He asked me how I got my torment, my ECX torment, to go above 20. He said, I ain't never seen one of them go that fast. And I was like, all I did was put a 7-cell nickel in it. 7-cell nickel metal. And it got me an extra 3 to 5 mile an hour. 
from what it came with a six cell. And that's all I did. Didn't even put a lipo in it. And I got an extra three to five mile an hour. Stock tire, stock body. Got an extra three to five mile an hour out of it just by going with a seven cell nickel metal instead of the six cell because I knew the ESC could handle that. I got three to five mile an hour just out of that. And we're talking a stock brush 15 turn motor. You know, you got three to five mile an hour by just a battery change. So a lot of things can really get it up there. But I don't want to put metal gears in the two wheel drive track in my two wheel drive ECX torment just to try to, you know, get it up there real fast. I would get me a different short course truck that already comes with metal gears in the transmission. If I was going to try to do brushless and try to do any kind of speed runs. My, my RC tracks, this little tracks won't drive at all. Could have a burn up ESC could have went. Me. Do, do you still have steering? If you got steering but it won't move, the ESC could have choked. Could have went on it. What I've been using is a socket wrench nut. I would say most of my RCs go 18 to 20 to 25 mile an hour. I use that. Yes, they're steering. So it's got steering, but it won't go forward or reverse. And then you know the battery's good. And then you could have smoked the ESC. The ESC could be fried on it. Or it could just be, need to, if it's one that can be reset, it could just need to be reset. Some of them have a place where you can reset them. A little button to reset them. You can just hold that button turn the controller on, hold that button for a certain amount of time, and they'll reset. Like Fishing with Pickle Hunter said, it could be a blow, a motor could be smoked. But if you've got another RC, you can easily, easily test the motor theory. Take the motor out of that one, plug it up into another one, plug it up to another ESC, See if the motor spins over. If the motor spins over, you know it ain't the motor. Then you could say it was the ESC. The issue is the back of the truck is grinding bad and it will only go eight mile an hour. Well, that's either a spur gear or diff gears. That's what that sounds like. If it's moving, if it actually drives, then your motor's still working. You could have a bad spur gear or you could have a bad gears in your diff. Especially if you set it at the back of the truck. Because a spur gear, it can slow one down that would do like 20, 30 mile an hour. It can slow it down to two mile an hour. And then soon you'll hear it just and it won't move at all no more. When it does that, then you generally know it's the spur. If, if it won't move when you hear it making noise. Yeah, I found Rouse 21. It was a little too technical, a little too boring on it. I always liked Tin Man and some of the other guys that did it. I always like them better when it comes to speed runs. But yeah, Rouse 21, if you really want technical, technical, give him a look, see what you think about it. But I'd rather check 10 Man out, you know, and some of the other guys that did it, like 10 Man. So should I take it to a hobby shop and have them look at it? Hey, if you've got a nearby hobby shop and you can go in there and have them look at it, by all means. Get it looked at because that they can generally look at it. Put a you know, you got a battery there, take a battery with you that's charged up, put it up there. They can look at it and probably tell you what's wrong with it in less than two minutes. 
But if you're telling me that it moves, it's got good steering, but every time it moves, it gets up to about eight mile an hour and you're hearing noises in the rear end of it. That could be gears in your rear diff, or that could be your spur gear. Is a slight chance it could be your pinion gear, but I would vote spur gear or rear diff gears. You know, and spur gear would be my first choice. I finally ate one up in the uh, ECX Torment two wheel drive. I had that thing for three years. I bought it used, ran it for three years with a used, used truck. Beat the crap out of it for three years. Never tore it up. One day I went outside. It wouldn't do but about five mile an hour across the yard. And when it come back up by me, I heard. Rear, rear, and then it just quit moving. Pulled the body off of it. Looked at it. And the spur was chewed to smithereens. Went all aluminum, but when I wrecked, I bent so many parts, so I got every RPM part made. So you're saying your battery won't hold a charge in your boat. One or two things. Your charger's bad and not giving it a full charge, or the battery's bad if it won't hold a charge. Because I've got the same thing with my little ECX Barrage 124 scale crawler. It won't run but about two minutes on the battery. About two minutes. That's about how long it'll run. The battery won't get a full charge. So it's either my battery that's bad or my charger that's bad. And I just haven't fooled with it. I'd say mid-40s. I only use those NIM packs. It also came with the older slash that I sold. It came from Control Hobbies. Yeah, but you can you can take take your battery, take your battery, take your charger, and take your boat, and take your truck, and just go to your local hobby store. And say, hey, I got a I got a boat that's not getting a full charge. Is there any way y'all can test my battery for me and see if it's defective? Because if they tell you your battery's good, it'll, it's holding a good charge, then it could be your charger. Take it, take your stuff with you, take your truck as well. Make sure you charge the battery up for the truck, and when you get it there. Tell them to just run it across the floor and listen to it. And they can probably tell you inside of five minutes or less, especially with the truck. The boat might be a little bit harder for them to tell you, but the truck, they should be able to tell you in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> it was in an armor fury. Excuse me. Well, the reason I was telling him, Steve, about his boat is because, yeah, it could, the battery could have just gave out that quick on him because batteries, that happens sometimes with batteries. Like my older boat, that one that I run down there at the lake that time, the battery that came with it is still perfect. Works like a champ. And I've had that, I bought that boat used. I've been using it for th three years. Still works. But the b battery that came with my uh, jet ski looking boat. I ran it one time with that battery and the battery went bad. Quit working. And I had to get another battery for it. So yeah, could be a defective battery. Could be the charger ain't charging it completely. You know. Could be one of those. So yeah, he definitely needs to have it looked at. Because I'd hate to tell him to buy a battery and it be the charger. I hate to tell them to buy a charger and it be the battery. 
Me, I'm probably going to go ahead and buy both for my little bitty ECX little barrage 124th scale. You know, I'm probably going to go ahead and just buy both for it. And then I can just mark on that other battery if it is bad. I can mark bad on it, you know. And then end up cutting the end off of it, keeping the end, and just throwing the battery away since it's a NIM. And if it's the charger, I can just throw the other the bad charger away. But go ahead and order both. That way I'll have them. I've been fishing so much, I haven't messed with my RCs. Well, I went fishing, put up the video a couple days ago of me out on my kayak fishing down here at the local lake. And then I went out and RC'd today. But yeah. So yeah, I went fishing just a few days ago and then turned around and did the RC thing today. I got to get ready and uh, edit the video in the next next day or two so I can get it up on YouTube. Yep, I know what you're saying, Steve, on that one. The NIM packs, they can be fickle that way. They can get damaged easily. Like you say, if you run it or you overrun it one time, the battery may not work right the next time. It might only give you half of a charge, or it may not charge again. Like, like it did with that, <clears throat> like I said, the, it's a boat, but it's got the shell of a... Uh, jet ski style up on it to make it look like a big jet ski you're supposed to put like an action figure up on it to make it look real and i ran it one time with a barbie on it did one video where barbie's riding a jet ski and got it home and the next time i went to try to run it that stock battery with that brand new rig was already dead so i got one run out of the battery and the battery didn't didn't charge anymore so what I did is I took one of my other batteries that I had extra for like my Torment. I had an old 1800 NIM for it. And I just cut the end off of it and replaced it with the Tamiya end to go to that jet ski so I could still run it if, if I wanted to. Barbie breaks everything. Yeah, I mean, she's just such a klutz. I guess it's just a blonde thing. I don't know. But she definitely apparently broke the battery because I put Barbie's butt on there, took her out for one little run at the lake, and then the battery wouldn't charge anymore. I don't know what to say about Barbie. Man, maybe I should have put Ken on the boat instead. I don't know. Maybe Ken on the jet ski and it would still be working. I don't know. Or maybe G.I. Joe could have fixed it. I don't know. But yeah. I had to get me another bat. I had to do me up another battery for it. I want to get me one that uh, one of the fig action figures where their knees and everything actually bend, so I can do another video. She already broke Ken. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. Hey, man, some good goals. If you can get it there, Gorilla Bear Tech, some great goals. I mean, and you can probably get all those goals. I think you should be able to hit 60 on two, so up to 60 on 2S. If you get the right setup, I think you'll get there. Kyosho makes them jet rider things. But, yeah, I've got – I mean, this thing is – it's – it's longer than my 
laptop that I'm on. And this is like a 15 inch or more laptop. It, this thing's like almost almost two foot long. This jet ski looking thing. So I slapped Barbie up there on it. It's like a foot and a half, two foot long. I slapped Barbie up there and ran it one time. And the only thing was she didn't sit completely down on it because her knees didn't bend. So I want to get me one of the action figures, like a Max Steel figure or G.I. Joe type figure, and set one of them down on there and run it across the lake at least once and do another video with it. Because when I bought it, I got it cheap, even though it was brand new. And I only wanted to get two or three videos out of it with somebody riding it. You know. I think Kyosho just made a new version of theirs. May have to look into that down the road. I want to be at 85, 95 and faster by the time I'm almost 33. Don't slap the Barbie. Just Marshall, just throw some shrimp on it. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious to see how fast on 4S, 100 plus on 6S. Not that impressive. When you've seen 100 on 3S. There's a video on YouTube of a guy getting a VXL to 90 or 100, but he wouldn't share any details. I think he shot the video and swapped the electronics out before running it, laughing out loud. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they won't even let you see the engine, nine times out of ten, it wasn't running the stock VXL system. If they're not even willing to let you see the engine. You know, now if you see somebody pop that body off and they cover their spur gear or their pinion gear, but they let you see it's a Traxxas VXL system, then you know they're more up front. And then they set the body back on it. They let you hear it when they plug the battery in, let you hear how many cells it's running on, and then they take off and do a speed run and they show you their GPS. You know, that lets you know, okay, that guy was running a Traxxas VXL system and all he did was change up spur gears and pinion gears and maybe tires and body to get where he got, you know. There was an edit between the video and him showing the electronics in a speed run. Yeah, that makes you think. He was crooked about it. <clears throat> if there's an edit from where the speed run, and then all of a sudden he's showing you the electronics, you don't know whether it's all truthful. But if he showed it all in sequence and there was no edit and it was just all straight through, he walks you up to the car, puts his hand over where the spur and pinion are, shows you it's a VXL system, shows you the battery he's running, puts the cover down on the car, pulls his finger out from under there, puts the body pins in, and runs it, and then comes back and shows you on the GPS what it's run, you know he got it. With my one-tenth cars that are two-wheel drive, I'm going to just use either 32-pitch gearing from now on or use a Mod 1 gearing. 70 mile an hour with a 60-amp ESC and no more than a 3,800 kV motor was the challenge back in my day. 5,000 Moth 3S LiPo. Kenny Mile Per Hour Malenko. Search YouTube. Good speed runs. I got a custom sleeve, though, to fit Mod 1 gears on that 110 motor. You need a Castle ESC, SV3, or SV4 ESC. Man, back when I watched Too Quick For You, 104, and all the other guys, Tin Man, Dan P, you know, all them doing speed runs, I thought so bad. Man, I want to I do a speed run. I want to do a speed run. <clears throat> and then I got to hearing some of the prices that they had invested, and I'm like, man, I'm budget guy RC. It would take me forever to save up the money to get all that stuff. I would have to buy a low center of gravity 
Traxxas slash chassis and start from there, slowly build it up over years. And then I'd have to find a place to run it because I couldn't run it anywhere near my house because where I live at, it's all down dirt roads. And, you know, that's not the best for speed runs. You know, dirt roads aren't the best for speed runs. I'd have to go find a long stretch of paved road, you know, and do all that. After I started getting the car put together, then you got to go back and fiddle with the gearing, the motors, and the speed controllers. That is, if you've got the good everything else. Once your brush lens motor gets too overheated, it, it is destroyed. It will then make your ESC get overheated because it will try to supply that motor more amperage than it's wanting. <clears throat> I think that's one reason I stick with crawlers more. Yeah, my older neighborhood was more mostly paved, but this new warehouse spot I got is the best. Cool. A lot of guys used to do that. They'd go find like a storage building and they'd pull up in the storage buildings that didn't have the fences around them and they'd pull up in their area and use their whole part, the length of their parking lot, you know, because you had all these storage buildings going down like this and you had a good wide spot like a single lane and they just run down through there and they could do it and wouldn't get in trouble because you know there would be there'd be days that nobody would come into the storage building area you know and they'd use those parking lots for speed runs uh old schools go out into a parking lot of an old school and use that and speed run through it Yeah, I have the Kyosho MK2 Hellcat. It's nice, but hardly any place good to run it. Yeah, I mean, I don't really see taking a Kyosho Hell Dodge Hellcat and putting it out here on my dirt road, running down the road. Unless I'm fixing to try to turn it into a rally Hellcat, you know, which would look good off-road, or unless I'm about to jump some ramps and really try to bash the crap out of this good-looking on-road car. I don't really see running it on a dirt road. So yeah, it wouldn't really be a good a good fit for me. There you want to find somewhere you can really let it rip. And if you can find those storage buildings that's got a good space in between each set of storage, each row of storage buildings, you can get some runs down through them. Traxxas was sending me a replacement LiPo and instead sent me a Colton Hobbies $3,000 motor inventory order. I called them and told them being the honest guy, I wanted to keep it. <laughs> Should have kept your mouth shut and sent me some. <laughs> Got to run, guys. Check my channel playlist for Traxxas Rustler. Good tech info there. Be safe, everybody. All right, be safe, Blacksmith. I called Carton Hobbies in Michigan and told them I was forwarding it to them. <clears throat> but yeah, massive clouds. I, I had a blast on my kayak a few days ago. Like you said, you get off here, you have a chance. Go look at it and you'll see what I was talking to you about earlier. There's another really good speedrunner channel on, called Motor Toys. His channel also really good. You guys should check him out. 
Now, uh, for you guys that are still here, I've got uh, I've got some of those Z-Man lures. I don't know. I don't know. I think I, they may suck. <laughs> I uh, had a company contact me and want me to review something for them. They said some of the stuff they would send me free, certain price stuff they would send me free. Other items that were higher priced, they would want me to cover a percentage of it. Of course, it would be mine to keep, you know, once I was done with the product. Uh, the free item they're sending me is supposed to be here about mid-May. I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want to spoil the unboxing that I've got to do for them. Uh, I got to do an unboxing of it. Then I've got to do a video using it. You know, and I, I'm, it may be one video with everything. It may be separate videos, but I've got to do this video for them and I get to keep it for free. If I don't like it, I can get rid of it or I can keep it and use it. But they also are going to send me a link supposedly for a chance to win something from the company. Now, it'll be a random item. It won't be a certain thing. You don't get to pick what you want. Duh. You're getting it for free, so it's just... And then if you don't like whatever, you know, if you won the item and you didn't like it, you could give it away to somebody. You know, that's the way that goes. But I thought it was pretty cool. They're going to send me this free thing to review, and they're going to try to set it up. I'm hoping to get it set up with this first item they send me. Where you can hook, do this link that's going to be in the description. It'll take you to the survey that you take. And by taking that survey, you get a shot at winning something for free. But you've got to, it's like once I put the video up, it's only the first 30 days that the video's aired that that will be available. After that, they shut it down and nobody else has a chance at winning, you know. And then they're wanting on the second item. If they like my first video, I do. They've already got a second item they want to send me. They said they might not be able to get it set up until the second item comes. But then that way people could go do a little bitty survey, like a five minute survey, and have a chance to win something for free. I don't know what it'll be. That's up to them. I don't have any control over that. But I'm just waiting to get the first item, review it. And see if they want to keep me around long enough to do a second review. You know, because if they do, if they keep me around, there's a chance they could, you know, start doing that giveaway through my channel. Which means you go on their site, take a five-minute survey, and you're entered into a chance to win something from their site. At their discretion, though. They'll just pick an item, send it out to you. And then when you get it, you can go, really? I didn't want this. Oh, my neighbor's kid might want it. My kid might want it. You know? Or you can donate it to a Goodwill store or something if you don't want it. But that's something that I've got should be coming soon. Yeah, some some of them uh speed runs are insane though. I mean, when they say when they show you the GPS and say out the number, you're like, Whoo! you're like, wow. Never had a high end, high quality transmitter. The best one so far is the TQI and the Spectrum DX2E. Those are the only two I can say that are the best to me. For the budget I'm at. I also have a decent high high end Spectrum STX2 from a Bandit. Now that was a uh, one of Ten Man's favorite start off cars. He had a Bandit that he was working towards getting at sixty.
All right, guys. It's been a blast. Peace, my friends. But I'm going to get ready and end this because ran out of drink and I want to go get me something for supper. I hope to see y'all next Tuesday or whenever you're available. I hope everybody stays healthy and everything. And again, I've got something coming from a company. They're, they're sending it to me for free for review. It should be about here about halfway through May. And either, either that item or the next item, if they select me to do a second item, they're going to try to set up a thing where you go to their site and you do like a five-minute survey or something like that. They enter you into a con contest and then they randomly pick a winner and you win something from their site. Don't know what it'll be, but I'm hoping they'll keep me around long enough to start doing that, you know. But it's probably about, I want to say May 15th, I should get the item from them that they're sending me for free. And they've already told me what the second item they want to send is going to be if they like my first video. I really want the second item too, <laughs> to be honest. The first item's cool, and I really want the second item. If I get it, you'll understand why. But uh, going to get out of here. Everybody have a great one. Everybody be safe. And Massive, definitely go check out that kayak video I just put up a couple days ago. You'll get a kick out of it. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, man. Y'all be safe. Y'all have a great one. Peace. Marshall, we out.